morning. Good morning, all of you. I'd uh, like to welcome you to the second plenary panel for uh, this year's, I, I can think I can say it, second annual light forum. And I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists. They include Olivier Bradencourt, who is the CEO of Sanofi Aventis, uh, Kate Bundorf, Associate Professor of Health Policy, of, of Health Research and Policy at the Stanford School of Medicine and a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, Joe Jimenez, former CEO of Novartis, and Andrew Moss, who's co-founder and co-chief scientist at Rome Analytics. Uh, we are coming off a discussion of a wide range of topics where data and what's done with the data through artificial intelligence and other analytic approaches can potentially have big impacts on health and health care. In this panel, I entitled uh, rather, uh, um, I think optimistically, Data is King, uh, we're going to focus in more on how uh, those changes are or aren't occurring and what the potential is, what the barriers are to making more progress, to using new kinds of data, new types of evidence to support transformations in care. And I'd like to begin by asking our panelists who are doing a lot of work in this area uh, about some, maybe some reasons for optimism or some reasons why transformation might happen. So uh, Olivier, Joe, uh, you all have extensive experience in the pharmaceutical industry. Joe, I think you're doing some other interesting things now related to digital health and other relevant topics to this discussion. Maybe you all could start out with a few comments about what you see as some of the best opportunities for data and AI to really transform medicine. Do I start? Please. Um, all right, so you, you do have uh, two revolutions going on, uh, one on the technology side, one on the biology side, and when they m meet, uh, it's very, very powerful, especially for an industry like ours. So if you think about how we are using AI now, it's basically in every single segment of uh, our sector and industry, starting with discovery and ending up, of course, uh, with uh, post, uh, post marketing studies. Uh, starting with um, uh, discovery, um, we have computer based, you know, proteins, computer based, uh, and using AI and all this huge amount of data coming from failed clinical trials, successful one, and more importantly for uh, system biology, which we understand much better now. So by doing the two, you can start working on potential uh, treatment, potential drug, you understand how tight and how uh, binded they are, and of course it's very important the binding between uh, a receptor and a drug, because at the end, if it's not uh, tight, then you have off-target uh, adverse events, therefore it's uh, very important. Uh, but that's a base. We go now much further than that. We can do um, multi-targeting using that process. So as we know, a lot of disease are not due to one mechanism, which, uh, which doesn't work anymore. Physiologically, very often it's two or three, and therefore we are developing molecules, one molecules with two heads, or warheads if you want, uh, targeting two targets or three even. We have tri-specifics going on now. Uh, and that, that really is helpful in the sense that it's more effective. Um, the next thing has to do with computational uh, network biology. And this is really revolutionizing what we do. Um, reason being that we understand now within the same cells what are the different elements, uh, how they are interacting with, with each other. And we also understand how cells are dealing with each other in the same organs. And the results of that through AI analytical tools have been to give us what we call pathways and biological pathways. And of course, if you have the physiological one, you understand when it doesn't work anymore, and you can influence what's not working in order to fix it. So I heard in the previous panels that they were talking about crossover pathology. Uh, in our world, very often the same pathway is responsible for different diseases, and uh, one come to mind in immunology and allergy, uh, you can have eczema and asthma and 
um, oesophagitis, uh, and many other different allergic reactions, which in fact are due to the malfunction of exactly the same, the same um, pathway. So that's, uh, that's discovery. When, we, when it goes to clinical uh, development, we, uh, then it's more specifically, I think, uh, real-world data. And what you do there is uh, trying to get uh, a, a good definition of the endpoint you can use in your clinical program. And I'm talking about the, uh, the randomized clinical program. Very often with the FDA, as you know so well, Mark, uh, discussing endpoints for a clinical program for a specific drug takes months and months, especially if it's an unmet medical need and you don't have any precedent. So using real-world data helps you define those endpoints and get agreement with the FDA uh, much faster than in the past and therefore save time and be, uh, and be there much, much more uh, effective. And last but not least, one day, maybe, through AI, because we do have patient population uh, simulation uh, and different types with different characteristics on which you can apply virtual drugs um, you, we may see a day where the FDA would be open to receive a virtual package mm. uh, with virtual patients, with uh, virtual drugs. I uh, hope that the FDA would still not be too completely virtual at the time. <laughs> uh, and um, that may be the future, but it's, it's, it's probably far from what we can, uh, we can do today. Um, we need to fix a few things before and have a real dialogue and on... Uh, on standards and, uh, but that, uh, in a nutshell, that's how you know the world is changing for us, for us from discovery to uh, registration and even going beyond. And we may have that discussion afterwards. What's happening? Oh, I think we will. But it sounds like quite a potential transformation, Joe. Yeah. To uh, build on what Olivier said, I, I think there are two areas where AI is going to significantly impact pharmaceuticals and and potentially overall healthcare. The first is. Uh, around uh, clinical data. So, for example, pharmaceutical companies have pristine clinical data on sometimes millions of patients. So at Novartis, we had 10 years of, of very, very good data, 500 clinical trials, over a million patients. To be able to mine that data in ways that, we, that no human can, to identify potential new indications, even for existing drugs or subpatients of populations, um, we're already starting to see uh, AI have an impact in that area. And I think there will be um, some pretty dramatic findings and uh, new uses for existing drugs beyond what Olivier was talking about in terms of discovery, so just the clinical portion. The second uh, area that I believe AI is going to have a big impact in pharmaceuticals is in helping us shift away from a transactional uh, system in this country towards an outcomes-based system. Outcomes meaning um, getting p where pharmaceutical companies get paid based on the outcome that their drug delivers for the patient. Today, those agreements between the payer and the provider are... Um, not very sophisticated. And they're not very sophisticated because there are a lot of variables that influence the outcome that we don't really understand. Uh, and also, sometimes in terms of real world uh, data, the data is not very good. So, uh, the ability of AI to take unstructured data and to make sense out of it in terms of real world data, I think, is going to create a step change in the pace of this shift away from a transactional approach where we know 25 to 30 percent of what we spend is wasted towards an outcomes-based approach where we can get rid of that 25 to 30 percent of waste and really only pay for the outcome that we've agreed um, the, between the payer and the provider, the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So those are, those are the two areas I think it's going to have a big impact. Joe, thanks. And Kate, a lot of your research is focused on what's working and what's not. Um, in terms of how healthcare is delivered, and I think that relates to some of uh, Joe's last comments. If you have these drugs, uh, how are we using them in practice? How is medical care actually being executed? A topic that came up a lot on the last panel. Uh, your thoughts about the big opportunities here? Absolutely, thank you, Mark. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I want to start out by saying, so I'm representing the rest of healthcare, and these guys have about 10% of the healthcare economy, <laughs> and I've got 90, right? <laughs> so, uh, so the, the well, market it's growing, is, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the market is huge, um, obviously. I think there are two areas in which there is a lot of opportunity, and the first one, you know, picking up on, on what you just said, is in the area of payment models. And I want to use, um, you know, as we've talked about in the last panel, um, in many situations, we pay fee for service, we pay for everything that's done and there's a desire and um, um, some push to move towards alternative types of payments for providers that would really flip those incentives. And let me use an example from the, um, from the prior session. Someone talked about uh, diagnostic technology and we could use artificial intelligence to get the diagnosis right, perhaps you know, the first time. Under a fee-for-service system, we don't really have, providers don't really have an incentive, a financial incentive, uh, to get the diagnosis the right the first time. You try something, you can treat the patient with a very expensive drug, and if that doesn't work, we can try something else. If providers were at more financial risk, those incentives would change, and we would really have a strong incentive to purchase the tools and invest in the tools that would get diagnosis right the first time for the patient. Um, so I think payment models are important. Of course, payment models um, have a, a, a tension in terms of their dissemination and the role of artificial intelligence. In order to sell a product that uses machine learning or artificial intelligence or big data to support payment models, we need to have someone who is paying using those payment models, right? So we need a market before we can start to sell those types of tools. But in order for providers to really you know, go full, full force into these payment models, they need to have the data in order to support their participation in the payment models. So this chicken and egg problem, I think, is a really important one. Um, and it will be um, probably, I, I would, I would um, suggest, an iterative process uh, to get us where we want to go, where the uh, providers of the tools and the providers of healthcare are kind of moving hand in hand you know, towards a, a, a different way of, of, of supporting payments. So the first was payment models. The second is um, in what works, right? So once again, um, I want to go back to an example from the prior session. Uh, someone gave an example of, um, oh, I think it was the uh, from Kaiser, using data on um, Kaiser membership, you can see that women who have had a uterine infection, their kids ultimately are more likely to have asthma. That is incredibly powerful, and um, in healthcare, I would say even more in healthcare delivery than in pharmaceuticals, we have an absence of what uh, of evidence on what works, what causes diseases, and what treatments work in order to prevent diseases. Um, and even, you know, not only what works, but how does it work differently among different people? You know, how do we design treat diagnosis and treatment for heterogeneous populations? So if we take that example, um, that's a very powerful example. One thing that I worry about as an economist and someone who analyzes data is that maybe there's something, uh, maybe there's something correlated with having a uterine infection. You know, maybe uh, women who are more likely to have a uterine infection were more likely to not feed their kids peanut butter or they were exposed to some environmental toxin or they took some other drug um, that caused the asthma in their kids. So I think a, a note of caution in using artificial intelligence and big data and machine learning in trying to figure out what works is to kind of go back and see whether we were right, right? So in the case of Kaiser, what would we do? We'd start you know, changing our treatment patterns and then we'd go back and see, well, did that fix the problem? You know, was that the thing that we wanted to, um, uh, was that the thing that we needed to do to prevent that particular problem? Um, and the final thing I would say, I guess, is a, a, a little bit uh, cautionary as well. Um, we have a lot of evidence in healthcare that we don't use, right? So this is an issue of uh, implementation and dissemination. So changing the, the payment incentives, I think, would help and would speed uh, dissemination of, uh, of, you know, of great new tools. Um, on the flip side, you know, and the, the folks talked about this in the last session, Patients are people, and so are healthcare providers. And um, there is a slow process of implementation. I think we have to really work on how to create tools that people can use, whether they are patients or providers, um, in order to deliver healthcare better. Uh, thanks, Kate. And uh, mention of tools, I think, brings us back to the technologies that are at the core of this conference. And um, uh, Andrew, I'd like to turn to you. 
Um, so we've heard a lot about a transformed kind of uh, healthcare system where uh, drugs and other medical products are not only developed more efficiently with, through much greater insights from bringing together data and using AI and other uh, techniques, uh, but they can be packaged into new kinds of care delivery models that are much more evidence-based, much more focused on outcomes and, and paid accordingly. Uh, is, um, uh, you're a computer science person by background, right? Uh, uh, and uh, not that many computer scientists uh, get out of school and then co-found a, a healthcare company. It's, uh, I, I guess you think that the, uh, the, the data and analytics are, are up to the task. That's right. I think they are. And to be fair, I didn't get out of school before we co-founded Rome. I was still finishing my PhD here. Um, Stanford style. Still right? graduated, so that's always good. Um, but machine learning algorithmically is there. The algorithms are ready. The question is, what are the industries that have data um, and are collecting the right data to apply those algorithms to really change the way that business gets done? Um, so Joe just brought up that there's huge promise in early stage drug development as well as late stage drug development in terms of what machine learning algorithms and AI can do to better inform that process. Um, and then Kate just pointed out that on the healthcare delivery side, changing what data is captured requires changing behavior of a lot of people, providers and patients. That could be difficult. The payment <coughs> models that we have today don't necessarily incentivize collecting very rich data about patients. That's something that we can hope to change over time. Um, what we can do now, though, is look at the R&D process in pharma because Pharma companies control what data is captured, right? They need to. You need to make sure that you're measuring all the clinically relevant attributes around an endpoint in a phase three trial. And certainly when you're talking about early stage drug development, uh, you want to be sure that you're measuring the right things to find the right targets, find the right candidates, and move them through the pipeline. So we already sort of control our own destiny in the pharma world in terms of what data is captured uh, for the entire R&D uh, process. And now is a really interesting time um, to look at that R&D process because in the early stage, uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to collect genotype and phenotype data. We now know that you don't always have to use human cells for those things. Um, there's a lot we can learn from other species. Obviously, translation uh, is a challenge. Um, but just last week, we had Daphne Kohler, who's a phenomenal machine learning researcher who's been working in healthcare for a long time here at Stanford and then at Calico, found her own company in Citro with exactly the hypothesis that we can now collect a lot of genotype phenotype data, apply machine learning to the data, and radically improve one of the sort of most costly, uh, most prone to failure parts of our R&D process, which is that pre-phase one piece of the process, right? So that's one piece where Collecting new data and then applying machine learning is going to, we hope, uh, reduce the overall R&D cost significantly and ultimately get better drugs that treat people in a more precise way. And then in the phase three, Joe just said, uh, there's a lot we can learn from existing clinical trial data. I've seen clinical trial data. You are not capturing 10% of the data you should be uh, to really leverage those things. And that's something that if you look at Verily, if you look at Project Baseline, which is essentially how they're prototyping how Google would run a clinical trial, they measure everything, really everything, and they figure out later what are the associations in the data, what patterns can we identify that then helps us improve the next trial or repurpose a drug target. Um, that's something that we need to do at scale in pharma soon because otherwise we spend so much on running a trial and we really only get one readout from it, which is the specific endpoint that we were testing. But we, we need to think of our entire R&D process as generating this extraordinarily valuable uh, source of data on what drugs work um, and what we see about uh, patients during that process. Because machine learning applied to those very rich, large data sets can really reduce uh, the R&D slowness uh, to market and the cost. Um, and I think it's a unique time in health. I think now really is the time that we can start making those changes if 
there's sort of the recognition that data capture is worth the cost. There's one thing that's come out of this. It's that the combination of new and richer types of data with the types of machine learning, AI, other uh, technologies that you're describing, um, uh, Andrew, could lead to these kinds of transformations. And I want to start with uh, going back to the comments from Joe and Olivier about how that's actually happening in the drug development process. And I totally appreciate that um, these kinds of techniques are making it easier for you to find uh, targets to bring forward and focus in on uh, not only uh, which drugs, but which populations, which indications. Still seems to me, though, that that drug development process itself, going through phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and then post-market, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to Andrew's comments, still it doesn't seem that really driven by these kinds of real world or broader evidence sources. It's still kind of a traditional data set collection using traditional methods that turn out to be pretty costly. FDA is still trying to undertake efforts around actually reducing the, the, the burden of data collection. So it seems like we're not there yet in terms of actually transforming uh, the development process, are we? And w why not? Uh, what, what needs to happen? We, we, we are not there and we should get there in order to get all the uh, economy of scales and uh, the cost reduction in drug development that Andrew was, uh, was talking about. So uh, the initial piece of discovery, that in my view, it's, uh, is changing pretty fast and we're really taking advantage of, uh, of AI, including real world evidence, real world data in identifying um, unmet medical needs and uh, what 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 needs to be done in the world of discovery. So that's uh, that's very helpful. Where it, it doesn't go as fast, it's during the second phase of uh, of uh, clinical development. If you look at what the FDA, in so far as accepted from real world evidence, it's actually a minimum, right? It's in the field of rare disease, uh, slight changes on the label and no much more than that. Uh, real world evidence helps us to manage um, signal uh, detection, yes, but having a drug completely approved on real world evidence data today, uh, not. We have not seen that, hopefully that would come. We, uh, we understand that the new commissioner Gottlieb is very much interested in, uh, in uh, real world data and evidence in order to move the, uh, the uh, potential development uh, drug process. He got 100 million, I understand, uh, but... Well, I propose that hasn't gotten it yet. But. Oh, he, he, he didn't get it, but he, he will maybe get so. 100 million. <laughs> He's supported by uh, the 21st century cure and, uh, and other aspects which are asking him to consider those aspects, but we are really, really uh, at the beginning. So <clears throat> what I see as an impact is more in the traditional randomized clinical trial, but with the uh, uh, help of digital. So for instance, we're working with Science37, which is a company which is not, you know, domiciled not so far from here, and uh, they are doing end-to-end -end distributed clinical trials. And it's basically people who are not, you know, moving from their home, you have a nurse practitioner coming and uh, drawing blood, and you can talk through your apps with your phone to the uh, main investigator. Um, and uh, basically, you are at home being part of a very uh, potentially very important clinical trial. So this could be, in, you know, ultimately a, a real acceleration of the way we are doing uh, doing clinical trial um, and programs, waiting for having clear direction mm -hmm. from the FDA mm -hmm. about what do we do with real world data and real world evidence. Because mm -hmm. so, so far, I think it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg. Uh, the FDA is saying, give me more for me to be able to judge whether or not the quality of the data is there and matches regulatory you know, uh, level or quality 
And the industry is actually very shy, saying as long as those guys are not giving us a clear direction and a clear guidance, mm -hmm. we're not really going to move because it may be a waste of money. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say we are. I think uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why it's not moving faster is because we have 50 years of a regulatory framework that has worked in the past, it's kept people safe. Um, and so there's a hesitance, I think, by the FDA to move off of that. You know, we were talking, talking about being able to collect more data in a clinical trial. Um, I think we have to give the FDA as an industry the validation that, that they can move in ways that are beyond just the traditional phase one, phase two, phase three, um, and then post-marketing studies, where if we're able to prove that a drug is safe, that is the first, um, the first and the biggest requirement then perhaps the FDA could relax um, uh, the criteria around efficacy um, and allow us to proceed with physicians who use it and collect data as we learn uh, to gain reimbursement you know, for additional indications as we learn. I mean, if you look at cardiovascular disease, this is one of the worst diseases, the heaviest disease burdens nobody is investing in it because what Nico, is required? One, in spite of the increase in number of drug approvals in recent years, one drug approved in the whole cardiovascular space last year for uh, anticoagulation. Right, and we invested at Novartis for a heart failure drug in Tresto, we got that to market, but these are, these are outcomes um, trials that are required, 400, 500 million dollar phase threes, uh, and so if, if this is a, a poor for-profit industry, you're gonna see resources being shifted more and more towards oncology where it's easier and faster to get a drug approved. And so cardiovascular disease might be a perfect place to go in and try and work with the FDA using uh, artificial intelligence and the, way to and, and the ability to collect data uh, assuming that we can prove to the FDA that this is a safe drug. L let me uh, uh, push you all, uh, the whole panel, on a couple of issues related to this. Having spent some time with FDA and, and now uh, at our program at Duke, we're on, in a collaborative effort with FDA around greater use of real-world evidence. Uh, so in conjunction with the issues that you have brought up, with moving to using these kinds of approaches for questions of effectiveness, uh, there are some real concerns about whether it's the drug that's having the effect. We heard on the last panel about some recent studies showing associations, and it's something you can see in, in a lot of these machine learning environments between a treatment or some characteristic of a patient or some other aspect of care uh, and an outcome where it may not be completely clear without patients being randomized the traditional way to, to different well-defined treatments uh, that it was the treatment really influencing the outcome. So learning more about how to sort out those kinds of causality issues seems important. FDA does seem further down the road on accepting real-world evidence and relying on real world systems for safety purposes now with its Sentinel initiative in the United States that tracks over well over 100 million patients and can, uh, can use uh, exactly these kinds of methods to find associations quickly. Uh, but these questions around effectiveness are very important. And I think also to uh, Andrew's comments, um, uh, there is a lot of care taken in doing studies the traditional ways around watching what you collect. Uh, if you all are right, and there are a number of other patient factors that influence uh, how well a treatment works and influence their outcomes, if you go to this broader approach, you're gonna find, I think, more of those kinds of associations along the way. And is that something that uh, pharma companies are ready to deal with? Well, Mark, I, I just think to play devil's advocate for a minute, we do not have a perfect um, process in place right now with the traditional clinical trial development of drugs. And as evidence of that, all you have to do is look at reproducibility, right? And, and, the, and the lack of reproducibility that occurs uh, when clinical trials are followed to the T um, with some very specific endpoints. Now, in a lot of people who are arguing against um, moving towards a real-world evidence-based um, determination of efficacy, are using that, but I, I just think that we don't really know what works and what doesn't work and in a lot of cases. And, and I think 
in those cases, I think we would lean forward. And luckily, we, we do have an FDA commissioner in Scott Gottlieb that's going to probably um, be much more progressive than, than the FDA has been in many, many years. Certainly and, a lot and, of interest. And so I, I would fully support it, but I would say let's, let's try to step back and think if you had a clean slate and you were designing the perfect drug development process that would keep patients safe and only ensure that those patients who are going to benefit from the drug got the drug, what would that look like? And it certainly wouldn't look like what we have today. So if I, if I may add, so you're absolutely right, and I think that discussion with the FDA is happening on real-world evidence because they're saying basically real-world um, data and evidence allows you to do 100 times right, uh, the same analytical work and the same analysis, and you're going to get positive at one point or another mm -hmm. and find something you like which you will present to the FDA, and we are not ready to. So. I think one way to go around that would be in the regulatory process to submit a pre-study uh, analysis, if you want, and really stick to that. Uh, I think that's, that's one way to do it. The other thing which could be of interest, but it, um, a little bit um, uh, up in the discussion, is can you go from your traditional phase three directly into the world of real world. So you do your traditional one, two, three, and with that large amount of patient in phase three, uh, instead of stopping there and maybe doing cost effectiveness, or which are very often rejected because by definition of phase three, program doesn't give you real world and therefore the payers, real world cost impact uh, cost aspects so people are saying you know what what uh, we, we we don't want that we don't we don't uh, consider the data to be valid so is there a way you can move those patients in real world and continue some type of comparison through um, through data we and and uh, with a standard of care which you can use for different things, including, why not, uh, cost effectiveness. So I think that's an interesting potential play, but it would mean that with the payer and with maybe the FDA and the regulator, you would have to, uh, it's almost like a continuous loop. Mm -hmm. You would have to adapt your guidelines and your treatment pathways. You would have to, uh, on, a, on a continuous basis. And Can that could be very, very interesting because you would have the formal piece already tackled and you realize how much the formal piece is conducive of being the reflect of what's happening in real life. And I, I, I like that concept. But So we are uh, talking here about uh, more of a continuous process of development. I agree that FDA is headed in that direction. Uh, I think some strong examples of that are actually on the medical device side where uh, the Centers for Devices and Radiologic Health have explicitly described a life cycle approach to product um, regulation where they expect to learn much more uh, about devices after they're on the market through a national system called Nest, uh, where they expect to actually learn and encourage more insights about uh, which, uh, how providers can use devices more effectively, refinements in the devices itself, while drugs aren't exactly the same. I think that's the same concept. But maybe we could think about this back from the healthcare delivery side and paying for it. Uh, it seems like what we're asking uh, payers to do and uh, consumers along with them is get these products when they come to market, maybe with some uh, early indications of um, uh, effects that, that may play out to, to long-term clinical outcomes, uh, maybe with some knowledge and for certain kinds of patients but not others. You can understand, uh, and, and as you said, not that much evidence on cost effectiveness. Um, you can understand, especially if we don't have good collect systems for collecting longitudinal data and using these same kinds of methods in the post-market care delivery setting, why there might be some reluctance on the part of payers to want uh, to, to pay uh, in that context, have just like uh, as we do now, a, a price that's set based on volume of services. And we talked in the last panel, you all talked earlier about moving away from those kinds of payment systems. Systems. Um, and we talked about chicken and egg problems there, uh, too. So I'd like to hear from you all, maybe uh, Kate, Andrew, uh, and, and then the rest, about what it's going to take to get that kind of model um, to have more traction and make more than incremental progress. I think there's one important thing to point out. Um, 
both as we think about sort of transitioning to real world, transitioning to, um, you know, what, what would payers think of this, and that's, wouldn't we like to know during a clinical trial, um, wouldn't we like to be able to control for someone's actual activity level, right? Um, if we're doing an Alzheimer's trial, wouldn't we like to quantify how cognitively engaged that person is by tracking their activities throughout the day during the time they're participating in the trial so that when we transition to the real world and when we go to payers, we can say, this is a drug, um, here's your basic clinical attributes, the one that we collect in the trial today. Um, we can also tell you a lot about uh, the match between our treatment and control arm in terms of physical activity level, cognitive engagement, um, all these other things that AI plus new sensing technologies, sort of passive sensing technologies, enable us to capture and are not really making their way into the regulatory filing conversation. Because of course, payers want to know uh, already, like what are the risk factors of their patient populations? And if we can start to match, here's a drug that just went through a phase three, here's the profile in terms of risk factors, and you as a payer, here's the match of that to your patient population, we can start to have much more sort of data-driven quantitative conversations about value and matching drugs to the right types of patients. But again, we, we aren't capturing a lot of that stuff in the clinical trial process, and I think we probably certainly aren't captured that to, uh, uh, aren't positioned to capture that on an ongoing basis from a care delivery s standpoint. Yeah, so I, I think if we're going to rely on post-market surveillance in the context of pharmaceuticals or kind of real-world data in the context of all the rest of medical care devices and everything else, um, that we're certainly going to need better data, right? We're going to need data that is more aggregated across payers and that aggregates claims data to electronic medical record data. Um, we will need bigger data systems and someone to analyze that data in order to track kind of the real world implications of the technologies and procedures and devices that we're, we are introducing into the market. Um, right now, I think there are two, two kind of important barriers to that. So one is uh, HIPAA privacy uh, regulation, right? So now regulation is um, very focused on privacy and it is hard to share the, in, in, in some situations. I think the other issue, which is equally or maybe even more important, is an incentive issue. So once a large organization has a fantastic repository of data, um, it has very little incentive to share that data with other organizations. So this is, this is very important in thinking about competition and antitrust and healthcare markets because it gives big organizations a very big market advantage in um, using these types of tools uh, to improve uh, medical care. And if we look out across the healthcare delivery system, there are a lot of, um, you know, solo, still solo, uh, small group, um, non-integrated providers, and those providers are at a competitive disadvantage in this world, right? So somehow we need to aggregate more of the data um, for the purposes of developing evidence and to increase competition in markets. So how are we going to change that? Uh, uh, Joe, Olivier, uh, pay for the drugs based on outcomes, invest more in systems that help bring together these data and overcome some of the privacy and other barriers? Yeah, out outcome-based uh, pricing or contracting, it's, uh, it's getting uh, more and more frequent, and uh, Novartis does um, currently several of those. Uh, we do too. Just to answer your previous question, and it's the same answer, uh, how do you give confidence to the payers that they are not in a bad deal because we got a product approved with a minimum data and the FDA or, and the manufacturer said, well, we're going to collect that in real world now, so start paying, we'll see later. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, th I think the answer to that question is outcome-based. You share the economic uh, risk with, with the payer. But of course, you have to agree on what, is, what performance means, mm -hmm. uh, what type of KPI are you tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, how you're going to get the infrastructure in place uh, to do uh, that. How do you, do you put the infrastructure, which uh, raise questions regarding the uh, anti-kickback statute. As you know, we would have to get a little bit more safe harbors mm -hmm. in order to do real outcome studies, including with Medicare and, mm -hmm. and Medicaid, because uh, we forbidden to do this kind of uh, uh, studies there because you're providing help. 
which is uh, getting into right, right there into the, the legislation. But I think that's one way to reassure the payers um, and to have something which is very, very dynamic and help you to have uh, a more specific and precise population of patients to treat with a specific, tr a specific treatment over time. And I think, um, I think we definitely need better data, but as Andrew pointed out, we're not collecting data that we could be collecting, and so there's a, a, a wealth of data that could be collected, and as Kate pointed out, we need more sophisticated data on the, even on the, the um, provider side to be able to be sure that what we're, they're paying for, we're actually getting the outcome. But I don't think we should use that as an excuse to not get started. For example, if the real shift to outcomes is just two parties agreeing on what that outcome should be. So for example, it could be lower hospitalization. If you take this drug, your cohort of patients that have heart failure will have 20% lower hospitalization. Okay, Kaiser Permanente can measure that today. And you could be paid based on your ability to deliver that outcome to Kaiser patients. And so uh, I think too often the fact that AI applied to or, or um, algorithms applied to real world data, you know, is somewhere in the future and we, we, we can't really get our arms around it. I think we have to start with these basic crude agreements around outcomes based on easy to measure endpoints and build in the more sophisticated um, real world evidence that's going to come using machine learning algorithms because this is going to be a journey. This isn't going to be, okay, automatically, you know, AI takes over the world in pharma. This is a highly regulated industry and it's a highly regulated um, uh, payer environment. And so I think we just have to get started. Mm -hmm. Bundle payments for joint replacements is a great example of that. Really simple to measure whether someone's readmitted to the hospital within 60 days of getting a procedure. The amount of it, data infrastructure and analytical capability that hospitals are building out in order to better manage patients as a result is wonderful to see, right? So like really basic incentives, easy to sort of structure our payments around those types of things. And that incentivizes laying the data and analytical foundation for doing more complicated things later. It is a place to start. It, it does emphasize, though, that um, uh, there, there is a ways to go. So preventing readmissions within 30 days, certainly something that patients care about. But when they get their joint replaced, what they probably care about most is how well are they going to be functioning in six months, a year or longer? And is this joint going to fail? And am I going to have to do a redo at some point uh, uh, down the road? So the capacity to bring in longer term uh, uh, outcome tracking, assessment, and, and payment. And before that, uh, it turns out uh, in the United States, like many other places, there's a lot of variation in the rates of doing uh, joint replacements, many of which uh, may involve patients who could be managed effectively through uh, physical therapy, other non-medical approaches, or, or more effective means of, of pain or, or mental health condition management. So taking that whole concept of, uh, of joint pain back further to uh, uh, an outcome approach that, that really focuses on how do you get the best functional outcome at the lowest cost. So it does sound like we have a ways to go. Um, I want to turn to the rest of you here today. I know all of you have uh, some uh, views and a lot of uh, efforts around trying to get to some of the goals that we've been talking about on this panel. So I'd like to hear about any questions or, or brief comments that, that you all have around uh, obstacles, opportunities to accelerate this progress towards more use of, of data, uh, machine learning, AI, and other techniques to really transform healthcare. Yes, in the back. And please uh, briefly let us know who you are when you ask your question. Hello, I'm Daniel Anderson, and I work at Invite. And through the discussion on controlling for variables and starting to understand some of the, the outcomes, we've talked about lots of different types of data, but I think it's notable we haven't talked about genetics. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear from the panelists about how genetics might be able to be greater uh, integrated to understand outcomes. And in particular, genetics has been used pretty widespread for biomarkers and to do drug discovery on the preclinical side. I think its use has been less uh, frequent uh, in the, the, the clinical stages. Now on a few drug labels. So use of genetics as part of the shift. Well, it's a, it's a big question and we should have covered it already, but because it's one of the most you know, productive area 
in, uh, in the drug industry by definition, uh, more in oncology because it's easier to have biomarkers. But if you remember the Philadelphia chromosome discovery, it was 40 years before uh, you had the drug from Novartis called Gleevec, which uh, completely revolutionized the treatment of those patients. Uh, 40 years is a long period of time. And then the second you know, mutation which was discovered was uh, the uh, HAR2 for breast cancer, and that was Herceptin, and that was about 20 years. And then now, thanks to what we can do or not, we uh, can have a treatment uh, very specifically dedicated to a, a specific to a biomarker and a gene mutation in few years, and Pfizer put on the market, you know, Xalcori for ALK-positive lung cancer, and it took about, I think, three or four years. I was there at the time. I think it was four years. So we're gaining, uh, you know, speed, and uh, the question is a very good one. Genomic is going to help, but more specifically, some, I would say, uh, th therapeutic areas in our world more than others, uh, where genomic has more impact, and immunology, allergy, and, uh, and uh, oncology is definitely uh, the world where it has the most uh, impact. When it comes to chronic disease such as diabetes, because you have more than 20 genes which are involved in establishing uh, you know, the pathology, and uh, it's, it's, it's more, much more. Does that difficult. mean that, uh, that so there, there are some relatively straightforward uh, uh, gene um, uh, genomics ap applications um, for these more complex diseases, which unfortunately is a lot of the disease burden out there. Uh, is there a path that includes genomics, but maybe also proteomics, other uh, computable phenotype issues that can uh, get to a larger part uh, of that uh, patient population? I think it will come over time and help us navigate those very complex disease. But there is no one example I know, unless Joe has something in mind, or uh, where uh, this is as in chronic in the chronic disease world, it is as impactful and clear and simple uh, as in oncology. No, I think the biggest impact that AI is going to have is on those diseases where there are more complex there are more complex um, uh, gene interactions. So even diabetes, right? Everybody has given up on looking at looking for a genetic basis for diabetes, but it's probably because it's beyond the, the, the ability of us to analyze today. So if you apply machine learning, I think we're going to be able to, over the next 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry, really identify um, some of the key drivers. Today, it's pretty much isolated to oncology. Everybody has very big oncology databases, um, yet we don't understand even the, um, the complicated um, disease areas where there are multiple genetic mutations even within oncology and machine learning is now allowing us to better understand that and to better target um, those diseases with new drugs and new new mechanisms. So I think it's going to be in those areas. Mm -hmm. Also, it seems like it's going to take more types of yes. data along with the, the, the genetic yes. information. It's not just going to be genetic. So other uh, questions or comments? Yes. Uh -huh. And, uh, payers and pharma, uh, it seems like the payers can see when the drug was prescribed because they paid for it, and they can see the subsequent cost of that patient because they're paying for it. So it seems like they should have the data as is to make the judgment call of do they want to continue to pay for a drug. What's missing? What is missing? Why aren't we seeing more of these uh, risk-sharing contracts? Is it the regulatory barriers that you mentioned? Is it not having enough data? Is it just these are it's new and different? No, it's hard both. I mean, it starts on the payer side, right? Well, there are many payers who, are, who understand that if they shift to outcomes, they're going to lower the total burden. But there are many of them that don't have the ability to do that. So budgets are siloed. So you have a pharmaceutical budget, you have a hospitalization budget, and when you start talking about looking at our, an outcome that crosses those budgets, you sometimes have to go to the CEO to get anybody who has you know, all those budgets rolled up into one. So we find that when we talk to payers, that's one uh, big bear, 
big barrier. Now, there are some great progressive payers that have great data, and they're all over it. And I think in the, you know, in the end, those are the payers that are going to win in the long term because, they're, because they will have an advantage. But it's not just the payers. It's also on the pharmaceutical side. Many times we are uh, reluctant to enter into agree agreements, risk sharing, where there are many, many different, um, let's say, uh, uh, variables that are impacting that outcome. So to the extent that we feel very confident that, that patient adherence is going to be relatively good for a particular drug, we will enter into a risk share, but if not, um, pharmaceutical companies tend to hesitate. So I think it is. It's around thinking about the structure of how payers are, are organized, uh, and then it's around thinking about how to isolate the variables that are going to impact the uh, outcome and then being able to measure that in a systematic way. I, I completely, completely agree uh, with Joe. For uh, many years, it wasn't clear, especially in chronic diseases, when you were doing those kind of deals, um, how the patients were going to behave. Even in a simple, you know, statin controlling cholesterol, are you sure there is compliance and adherence to the treatment? And and, and what can you do to improve how, that how, how strong is the outcome, mm -hmm. and uh, how much risk you, as a pharmaceutical company, if the patient doesn't behave appropriately, um, should you, you know, should you take? I, I, I think one way around that is actually personalized medicine, and uh, more. Uh, you know, secure you are in the outcome because it's so personalized and very often it implies genomics, then I think it would open up and uh, pharma company would feel much, uh, much better going with, uh, with risk uh, sharing. It's the beginning of it, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and again, at the beginning, the, uh, the insurance companies which have relatively, at the time, had relatively small margin. I think they're getting fatter recently, but uh, had small margins. They didn't want to take much risk. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's getting there, but it took more time than anticipated. Yeah, and, and to add that, I, I think those are, are great points from the, uh, the payer and the pharma perspective, that we need uh, an outcome that people care about that is verifiable. We need it to be um, for the pharmaceutical company to take the risk. The use of the drug it has to be under their control somehow. The adherence problem is a big one, right? So and you think about that, and then you think about the cost of administering these types of contracts in the, you know, with, those, uh, with those tensions. Um, when you start to look out at the set of possible drugs and conditions which would, would meet those criteria where we really could introduce a contract, they start to become kind of smaller and smaller. You mentioned personalized medicine and um, some of the further steps that could be taken to you know, make these contracts work better for, yes. for individual patients. The last panel spent a lot of time talking about consumers uh, in all of this. Uh, we've been focusing here on new contracts between payers and developers of medical products. And, and Kate, uh, uh, I think you mentioned healthcare systems as well, all focusing on outcomes. Uh, any comments to add about where consumers and, and uh, uh, applications or other tools that consumers can use could fit into and accelerate this progress? Yeah, I mean, I feel pretty enthusiastic about Medicare's new initiative to uh, put more data in the hands of consumers. I think that will be a, um, you know, Medicare starting and possibly other insurers following along will spur a lot of um, development and innovation in consumer-facing applications that will be more functional and more valuable to consumers than they would have been in the absence of this type of data. So I think that's important. Um, I think the other side of, of you know, we, I think we can't only rely on consumers. We still need to deal with the other side of having large databases where we can develop the evidence that developers can use to make applications in order to um, uh, uh, have apps and, you know, different types of interventions that actually help consumers use their data. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I think uh, patient reported outcomes is going to play a key role in the future, but I think that data also... Um, is, uh, has some of the same limitations as, as everybody go. else's data, and so it's going to have to move together. Mm -hmm. Another question over here. So go ahead. Was that, sorry, you? Yeah. 
Yeah, just speak up <laughs> until they get to you. <laughs> Do you think there is a role for patients in the risk sharing and the outcomes performance? So taking it the next step and, and starting simply uh, to Joe's point, what, what are you seeing or what could we do right now that takes some of that patient generated data but involves them more around the risk sharing and outcomes performance? And what are some examples that you've seen or that you, that you dream about that you'd like to see? How do we start getting patients more actively engaged and start collecting uh, uh, some of these patient reported outcomes, which seem very important for, for a lot of uh, conditions? They, they are more and more participative, right? So we're talking about the four Ps and the personalized and the participation of patients. I think they are. When you look at chronic diseases, their uh, adoption of uh, connected devices, uh, we are creating with uh, with very uh, we have we have a joint venture called Onduo, and we have a virtual clinic when it comes to diabetes patients, offering all kind of services and uh, and really driving the outcome. Um, and we see a lot of adoption. Um, it's it's a start, but I would be I would be hopeful. It's more uh, on the regulatory side where. Uh, data generated by the patient through potentially connected devices or survey about quality of life of disease progression or are not usually very well regarded by the regulator. So depending what you want to do with, uh, with the data. Well, they're not very well if it's, validated if it's all, or standardized if it's, either. Well, I think a good example of that is um, what Novartis is doing with Lucentis. For macular degeneration, there's an app that a patient can use at home to measure uh, degradation of visual acuity. So instead of getting an injection every month or every two months, um, the pa and coming in and finding that they potentially after an office visit don't need an injection, they can actually sit at home and, and identify when they may need an in injection and then come to the physician's office then to get it. So that would be a good um, base upon which to start some kind of a, a, of a um, outcomes-based or risk-based sharing that involves the patient. And that's, I think, one of the biggest places that AI can have an impact in the very near term uh, in terms of getting patients engaged because if you look at systems like Amazon Alexa and Google Home, right, we have really high quality microphones in your house that are capable of prompting you with a question. So if we think about drug adherence or we think about engaging with patients to discuss all the lifestyle factors that are associated with many chronic diseases, right, macular degeneration is one, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, a lot of things where keeping a patient engaged and understanding more about that patient through AI-enabled connected devices and sensors um, can really improve patient outcomes, for one, and also start to help patients like feel more empowered and from a payer perspective, you know, help them feel potentially more responsible uh, for their role uh, in improving their own health. Yeah, I, I feel cautiously optimistic about this. Um, I think changing patient behavior is very, very difficult. Um, and I think there is a lot of innovation going on right now, and that's all very exciting. I guess I would put in a plug for we need to start studying this to try to figure out what works, right? So we don't have everyone recreating the wheel in every application that they, they develop in the context of patient engagement. Compelling evidence. Now, just a show of hands, I see a couple up, so I'm gonna maybe we, we are running tight on time, so maybe we could combine uh, these two. Uh, please go ahead. Spent, um, my name is Saul Rosenberg. I'm with a company called Psych Data. I've done research in patient reported outcomes in the psychiatry department in UCSF for more than 30 years. And I can tell you that the measurement of behavioral health and psychosocial uh, perspectives is robust and as good as anything in science. Uh, for some reason, the word is not getting out that psychological measurement has really progressed. Mm. So I, I would like to make uh, people aware of a, a resource. The National Institute of Health developed um, a program called the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System that is phenomenal. And um, that system has recently become available within Kaiser, within EPIC. 
uh, this is a, a game changer because for the first time, we actually will have access to tens of thousands of records of really good psychological data. So people are interested in this, I suggest you just Google mm -hmm. NIH patient reported outcome measurement information system or promise. Great, Thank, thanks Hal on that. Uh, system promise, as you said, uh, a lot of validation and use of measures for behavioral health and the like, but also a wide range of other uh, uh, conditions as well. And some of those are starting to be used in pilot programs for, for payment. Uh, CMS has had some, some interest in that too, so great resource. And over here? Uh, yes, my name is Todd Townsend, I'm with Merck, but this is more about my time out of the office of the commissioner and advising kind of device companies. One of the things that a lot of uh, device startups want is to be told they're not regulated. And they've even done so much as force the FDA to say that after they've already said that in their own emails, but they say, you know, this is my own opinion because that's the bottom line of every government thing. Similar to what you're saying, do you know of any drug company, again, I work for drug company Merck, I don't think of any drug company I know of has gone to the FDA and said, here are these, you know, this is our data we're collecting, it's real world data, and they've been turned away. I think this is more about risk mitigation and forecasting results. It's a lot easier to do a, tr a trial. It's a lot easier to do two trials and, and get an answer and forecast that to your investors. So do you think that maybe, you know, one of your companies would step up or maybe one of my own and actually, uh, do it right, be a maverick and challenge the FDA. So uh, maybe one piece of advice to companies here is uh, go talk to FDA about pushing forward in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to use this opportunity to close out with a panel. So and comment on that piece of advice, but we've got a lot of people from innovator companies here who would like very much to see more rapid progress in exactly the kinds of topics we've talked about. So uh, if you all could also give just your last best quick piece of advice for how, to, how they can help uh, move this whole effort forward. Well, helping us in uh, the different segment in order to shrink timelines and cost. Uh, and I think we are very open, uh, AI, machine learning, digital, everything. Uh, again, at the end, you still have a regulator to be convinced. Uh, but uh, Talk to him. <laughs> we, we, are, we are the integrator now, more than anything else, right? We, we are the translation in medicine companies and uh, we can pick up the discovery and make that tangible at the bedside of the patient. But we are not doing that alone. We are integrating a lot of things which you are providing us with and uh, certainly uh, when it comes to data. So uh, they're already part of our world. You are part of our world and you will be even more tomorrow. Um, I think to uh, think about the economic incentives of the organization or party uh, for which you're developing an innovation, right? So I talked to lot, lots of entrepreneurs in my, in my uh, position at Stanford, and many times they haven't thought through um, when they have an innovation that sounds fantastic and, you know, can improve health, they haven't really thought about in whose economic interest is it to adopt this innovation. Price transparency is fantastic. Patients, if they don't pay much out of pocket for their healthcare services, they don't really need a price transparency um, um, application. Providers are, are the same. So uh, in terms of thinking about innovation, I think about matching the innovation to the incentives in the healthcare system. If we want to think about population-based um, uh, healthcare and who has an incentive to really think about the health of the population. We want to think about uh, Medicaid organizations that are capitated, Medicare Advantage plans, self-insured employers, etc. My advice would be to try. Just go and try. Talk to the FDA about um, innovative um, trial designs using advanced analytics to help you and you might be surprised at the reaction that you get and also the reception to doing something that is breakthrough. I'm in the same boat as you. I'm a founder of a startup. Uh, I, the way I see it is these things are happening. They're possible. The regulatory barriers to entry are high, but as we've just heard, if we talk to FDA and especially with the current commissioner at FDA, there's some promise uh, that we can you know, get innovation into the regulatory process. And the way I see it is these things are happening because they're possible. Pharmaceutical companies can make these things go faster by adopting these techniques and working very closely with small innovative companies. They can resist and be replaced in 20 years by a new generation of pharmaceutical companies who do embrace these things. But fundamentally, 
the, the sort of force behind the science and the force behind uh, our current generation of technology is going to enable these things. It's just a question of who will be the, kind of the winners and losers as these things play out. Yeah, and uh, how quickly and effectively we can get there. One final resource, uh, our program at Duke Margolis supports a value-based payment uh, consortium and a real-world evidence consortium that involves many of the organizations represented, some of our panelists uh, uh, today as well, uh, as well as involvement from CMS and FDA who all very much want to see more rapid progress in this regard. I want to thank our, our panel for a, for a great discussion and uh, we look forward to the, uh, to the rest of the day. Let